multiple collections within the portal. Uh, a lot of times, a lot of collections within the portal is a snapshot of a specimen database that's managed within the herbarium. However, there, there are a number of collections that are moving towards managing, managing their data directly within the portal itself. So down here, you have this live data set. And up there is the snapshot. Now with the snapshot, there's a number of tools built in there where those snapshots can be updated on a nightly basis or push of a button or if it's not active, maybe a collection will be updated once every six months or something like that. But our goals through the portal give that power, that control over the collection manager so they could update it when they want. You might find an error in your central database. Go there and fix it right then and there, and they want that error to actually go up the web right that second. So depending on the situation of, of the herbarium and the abilities of the personnel in there and, and how they have their data and what platform they have it, there's a number of collections that can actually go up and refresh their data every five minutes if they want to. <laughs> now, the uh, managed data directly within the portal is really well, it's a good design and it's working really well for small collections, um, especially collections that, that don't have regular personnel, <coughs> collections that are managed on a volunteer basis. Collections where they, they typically had their data <coughs> on a computer in a spreadsheet and then they went away for the summer and the collection door was closed and when they came back the computer was gone because IT came and they needed it for somewhere else and they formatted it or, or they didn't have a good backup. So with the portal situation like that, it's the portal manager that's actually doing all the backups, making sure everything's accurate, making sure it's not in a spreadsheet, <laughs> making sure it's a robust data model, and getting the data out there to everyone else. So they're very, they don't have to worry about that. They just have to worry about going out, collecting, coming back, making labels, and managing the specimens. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Now, importing data into a portal is, um, can be done in multiple ways. So there is interfaces in there that actually ingest it from a bigger portal, um, IPT. We actually don't have to be for enabled yet, so that's incorrect. Um, and you may not, so. And then there's, um, depending on where your database is and firewalls, you can even set it up to actually do a direct read or have, um, have um, time job that actually run and harvest it and import it. And there's a lot of different methods. The most popular method is to import it as a flat, flat file. So the central database will output a Darwin Core compliant um, spreadsheet. And then there's a mapping interface that will ingest that in. And I'll walk you through, <coughs> through ingesting data. And for this case, so I don't actually ingest it into someone's database, I'm going to my own internal system. So this is a sandbox database. So you can set Ed Gilbert. So right now I'm going to say import specimen records. And here's a bunch of import profiles that ASU has actually been using for different people. So you can have different schema mappings and save them. And I'm going to actually create a new one. And just do a file upload. And I'm going to say tests. Salix test. So Salix is actually an OCR application out there that's developed up at ASU to to actually do OCR and parsing and to help actually digitize data from the label into a database. But it's, it's a standalone and it outputs the Darwin Core compliant flat file. So now we're going to pretend like we're actually going to ingest one of those files. Now, Symbiota, the software, is strongly compliant and aligned with, with Darwin Core, so it uses 
Darwin for as, as this center schema, the center spoke to allow multiple collections to go into a single, single format and map all the collections together. So if you're importing a file that's strongly Darwin for compliant, you could actually do the auto map function and it will actually find out, it will actually do the mapping for you. Now in this case, I have my hand map a couple. And to do the mapping, you, you have to know Darwin for. And but once you do the mapping once, and as long as the format doesn't change, you actually go in and you can do an upload. So you do that mapping, you do it once, you don't have to do it again. It uploads it into a temporary file and then you can just transfer it and activate it into your, your central database. So it's pretty easy, straightforward. Now, I want to make a couple comments on selecting databases. So, unfortunately, there's no perfect database that's going to solve everyone's solution. So there's pluses and minuses to all these systems. And that's why it's so hard to choose a database. Uh, it's, it's not an easy decision. Now, for anyone managing their data in Excel, I, I just say please know because <laughs> working with, I worked with a lot of data and importing, I spent a lot of time importing data. And there's a lot of errors that, that come from Excel databases. And it is big quote, database. It's not a real database. So, and you know, some of these problems is Excel tries to be really smart and smarter than you. And it says, oh, the decimal lack long, that's supposed to be a monetary number. <laughs> so I'm going to get rid of the past, the hundredth digit. Yeah. I'm just going to cut it all off. Or they'll convert dates in, into an Excel format. That's, that's the number of, I think it's the number of days since 1900. But, however, there's also a, um, there's also a European format, which is four days different for one reason or another. So there, there is a lot of problems and a lot of issues. So move away from that. Now, if you have your own access to FileMaker database, it's better. Um, however, you have your own structure. And it's not integrated in with the rest of the community. Or if it is, if you're really talented and you know the standards out there and you know what's going, maybe it is. And maybe, maybe it is set up to actually publish to um, GBIF or, or create Darwin for our archives or, or something along those lines. However, you know, you probably won't be there forever. And when you leave, there, you're the expert in that database and there's going to be no one else who carry it along. Now, if you move into some of the more robust systems out there, um, such as um, specify, you're, you're doing better, I think, in, in my mind. Now, and because they can concentrate on keeping the structure alive and keeping the connections to the other projects out there. And, and even after you're gone, continuing the development. Now, specify or symbiota, you can manage your data in in Myota, but there's pluses and minuses. So specify, they're, they're a specialist. You know, they're doing just the interface for collection data. So it's a more robust model for managing collections, in my mind. Now, we're actually, our main purpose of Symbiota is to do a consortium data set. And as a side project, we've actually started doing data management. Now there's a number of large collections that have moved over to managing their data directly in there because you do have some benefits to doing it through a consortium site such as duplicate harvesting. Or also it's, you can have your collectors going out there and enter their data under another project, an observation project, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. And then when, it, when they give you your specimens, you can migrate that stuff over rather than having to retype it. So there's a lot of networks with an consortium database that you can set up like this. So there's pluses and minuses to, to both sides. You know, Symbiota does have loan management now, but it doesn't have the robust report management. It's not as flexible 
as specify as making labels and so forth. Now, sometimes it's not a one or other type of solution, too. You could do a combination of, of these different, you do a combination of systems, too. For instance, with the uh, Lightning and Brow fight, there's a number of collections that actually, they have their central database in specify, but they want to use the consortium database and the Symbiota portal to actually do their data and make use of the dupes that are connected to the consortium portal. They're doing their data entry in there, and then they're importing their data into their specified database on a regular basis, all the new records. So that workflow works out well. And we have a project that we're working on right now to actually, um, between specify and Symbiota, where the specified database will do one button for <coughs> publishing to a portal. So we're not, we're not competitors, we're working together. So we're a team. <laughs> now, there's other things like, um, Argus and, and Katie Moo. Um, they're decent systems. I mean, most people have to use them and stuff like that, but, but you know, they cost money. And um, so that's one problem. I, I personally like the free open source model. Uh, now, there is another project that the Myota and Specify are working with. It's a project called Filter Push. So now we're getting all these data sets and these copies of these data sets distributed in all these different networks. There's MorphBank and, and Specify, and someone might have a Specify database and they might publish to one Symbiota portal or multiple Symbiota portals. They might do the Graphites to the Graphite portal, Lightning's, Lightning's portal, and, and so forth. Now, a lot of these interfaces have it where you can actually make comments or you can edit the data. Now you have a big disjunct information system where you have all these information that are slightly different from one another or the same object, specimen objects. So filter push is, is a solution that's trying to work out that solution to link all those actions together in a unified interface. And it's mostly being let out of Harvard. And James Macklin, he used to be up at Harvard, he's now up in, in Canada. So here's a little Oh, cartoon. Are you coming to bed? I can. It's important. What? Someone is wrong on the internet. So, I mean, we're very passionate people in these collections, and we have passionate opinions. So, so that's, you know, not only common here to get up there and say, oh, this is wrong. And if you're one of these interfaces and you can input your, your information, it's valuable information because you're an expert. Um, but the thing is, it has to get back to the source collection and so forth. So this is, this is an idea where, where it's submitted to one of these either filter push network or one of these data, <coughs> data sets that are disjunct from the source collection. And then it, it goes down and filter push is going to push it back to all the different networks. And they're going to use the authoritative managers of those collections and those databases to make the decisions on, on whether it should be accepted, applied, or just recorded. So, and that, so that's where the filter comes from. It's the uh, managers, the collection managers that are doing the filtering and the information is getting pushed back. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. And right now Filter Push is working with Specify, Symbiota, Morphbank, iDigBio, and they're open to working with other people. You mean, you know, Katie and I think they were talking to them, but you know, the funds have to be available to actually do the, do the networking. So here, here's the difference. On the left there, it's the different data sets, and there's a message, and then there's going to be a filter push network that's going to be a spoke, that's going to integrate all of it, and then push it down to the different people. So the last thing I'm going to talk about, which one do I? Good. Okay, good, perfect. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is, is actually, you know, we're managing the data, we're getting it out there, the specimen data. Um, now, how is this data used and how is it integrated into to other information systems or how is it integrated into the people actually out in the field, the data managers, uh, the students doing inventories, um, bioblitz projects, along those lines. So, you know, the, 
platform should be the core. I actually, I did my master's, I did a floor on the West Fork from Oak Creek. And I went in there and I documented that everything occurred there. I made specimens, I did, deposited my specimens in the floor of area. And then I, I published my floor in a journal. But the thing is, you know, there's a disconnect from that published checklist and those specimens. And it's been 10 years. Now, I, I know I made a, made a bunch of mistakes. Uh, I was just a student back then. <laughs> so, and, um, but the thing is, those, those annotations, when the experts came in and messed, fixed my, my errors, they didn't walk back up to this species list. So now we actually have a model that's being used within SciNet again. SciNet's been around for the longest time, and, and it's actually our most mature system out there, so that's why I'm doing a lot of my demonstrations here. There is an insect portal scan, and a lot of these functionalities are being applied there, but it's, it's a young portal, it's only been around for um, less than a year, so half a year. And right now, I'm gonna actually go down to um, San Diego, my parent area. So this is actually a floor that was done um, by a graduate student at ASU. And so she did a, a species list, and if you click on more details, you get a full abstract and, and link to the research data. Right now I can actually say display a list with the, uh, with the notes and options. Because she loaded the list, but then she also linked all of our vouchers to the names on the list to serve as proof. And these links are links directly to the, the collections where they come from. So for instance, so each of those are the vouchers, if you click on there, you see the full information. And you, in this case, you can even open it up and look at the specimen and verify it. Now, if someone comes along and annotates one of those specimens to change, maybe she mis-ID'd one of her specimens, and now it conflicts with the name on the list, she actually, as an administrator, should go up here to, to voucher administration. So there's a, a workbench that we're building in there's those bad work issues, so maybe I won't be able to make this so hmm? That's about making it so cute. Okay. Yeah, well, the connection is off. Off the question. Are you on the guest network again? I am. Yeah, it's been known to just die. All right, well, I think I have too many people doing too many things. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> Um, 
So it's actually it's supposed to be a plant atlas project of Arizona. And what it is, it's a bunch of volunteers that are going out there and doing these biological inventories. And they're documenting the flora within these areas. And they're all volunteers. And Native Plant Society, a lot of them don't have taxonomic training. Um, they're novice. Some of them are novice, but some of the better botanists within the state. It was amazing novice. But a um, number of them are not. And they'll collect something, they'll idea it to something. They submit it to an herbarium. They make their label through Planet, so they mix it up through an observation project. So it goes up on the map, the data goes into the system. It's an observation because there's no physical specimen donated to the herbarium. The herbarium gets the specimen and there's a symbiotic barcode there. So they could get a stack and they take out all the symbiotic barcodes, they go to a website, they scan all the barcodes on this special data transfer website after they log in. And it queues up the records, observations, and then they enter in their, their barcode or their identifiers or their accession numbers, whatever they use. And then they could transfer it in bulk rather than having to retype it. Now, then they go and they, they look at the specimens and they say, oh, this is way off. And they maybe annotate it and they fix these IDs. So these projects, these PEPAS projects are being done in direct collaboration with their barrier. So they're purposely going and looking at the specimens. Now, if they annotate their specimen, that new identification walks back <coughs> to the checklist. So the person doing the list, the checklist gets fixed, and they learn their mistake, and, and it's an educational experience for them. Now, also, if they were out there and they took a specimen, a picture of the specimen before they collected it, and they linked that, they uploaded it while they're making their labels to their observation. So that field image is linked to all the duplicate specimens that are in the system too. And the same works for DNA. So if you actually link, if you do a voucher and you send it away somewhere and they submit it to GenBank and you put the GenBank information in there, it'll be linked to all the duplicates within the system. Now, this same system actually can be used, people can create their own, as long as you have a login, you can create your own checklist. You can create a checklist in my backyard. And the identi interactive identification keys are all automatically built for any checklist. So that's available there. Now, the same model is being used for schools. So if teachers are going out there creating a checklist of the plants around the schoolyard, and they're using this interface to actually use it as, as a teaching method to teach the students of the uh, biotic communities and the organisms directly within their area. So here's an example of, of making labels. And then this is an example of the, of the network. So you have the original observation there. Um, it goes to the checklist. It's linked to the checklist. They submit the, the um, specimens to herbaria, and it creates a network of information all linked together. And there's two annotations done in one duplicate, and that information feeds back to, to all the other systems. So, that's it. In a nutshell.